When Roger Keene had gotten off with an 80-pound fine for economic oppression, it had intensified the dispute between the deputies and the magistrates. The event had also left Keene open to lots of frivolous lawsuits from Boston townspeople. Keene's support of Wilson during the antinomian controversy hadn't endeared him to them, and he was rich, and suing him was a great way to get a little bit of extra cash. So, reputation damaged, lawsuits were repeatedly brought against Keene at the local court. And in 1642, one of these lawsuits would lead to the total split of the Massachusetts General Court into a bicameral legislature. You're listening to the American History Podcast with Sarah Tungsalvola, the show exploring who we are and why by tracing American history from the 17th century to the 20th. But before I get into the court case, I'll give you a little update about what else was going on in New England at the time. As Weld and Peters advocated for Massachusetts and England, Puritan nobility and leading parliamentarians sent letters to Cotton, Hooker, and Davenport asking the three ministers to come to Westminster to meet to discuss politics and religious reforms. But Hooker thought that being asked to cross the Atlantic for a meeting was stupid. Davenport was the only minister that New Haven had, so he couldn't leave. And it wasn't worthwhile for John Cotton to go alone, so the request was rejected. Meanwhile, Uncass's rumor spreading continued, and Connecticut had become extremely worried about the possibility of Narragansett attack and asked Massachusetts to come join them in a preventive war against the tribe. Massachusetts refused, saying that the evidence of conspiracy was too flimsy to warrant such extreme action. Uncas and Miantonoma were clearly rivals, and Uncas could be lying. They summoned Miantonoma to Boston in September and interrogated him, but concluded that he was innocent of ill intention. And within Massachusetts, the biggest issue was the conflict between deputies and magistrates over the issues of the Standing Council and the Negative Voice, or veto power. If the deputies got rid of those two institutions, they would dominate the politics of the Bay Colony and so overwhelm the magistrates that the magistrates would only have a real say if the deputies were evenly divided. But with the two institutions in place, the deputies were the weaker of the two bodies. So first, they attacked the Standing Council early in the year. It was the more vulnerable of the two institutions because the majority of the colony's population, including its ministers, saw it as a potential source of arbitrary power, which was a big buzzword at a time when the king had just shut down parliament for 11 years. The magistrates weren't ready to give any more power to the deputies, though. They had already compromised on the issue of the standing council, allowing it to be changed from a group of all former governors to a group of only the people who were elected by the court as a whole. And the magistrates had just compromised on the body of liberties. They didn't want the deputies to keep pushing and whittling away at their power until Massachusetts was a simple democracy. But the deputies weren't satisfied by the compromises which had already been made, and they could easily use the fear of arbitrary government to rally popular support for their cause. So in May, a pamphlet by an anonymous author attacking the Standing Council was circulated around the colony until it came to the attention of the magistrates. The pamphlet said that the Standing Council was an alteration of existing procedures, which had been ordained by God and needed no altering, and that therefore 
The standing council was not only unnecessary, but it was wrong, unnecessarily divisive, and should be abolished. When the magistrates learned about the pamphlet, Winthrop immediately introduced a motion to track down its author, and the magistrates supported it, but the deputies wouldn't agree. A deputy named Israel Stutton had already been barred from public office as punishment for writing an attack on the negative voice, and they weren't going to let this pamphlet's author suffer the same fate. Winthrop pushed again, and the deputies demanded a guarantee that the magistrates wouldn't censure the author before revealing his identity. So, Winthrop suggested asking the church elders if the author should be protected, and the deputies countered by suggesting that they ask the church's advice on the entire debate, including the existence of the standing council itself. And the magistrates really had no choice. They accepted the proposal because otherwise they were at a standstill. Both sides explained their positions, and the ministers found a compromise. They said that they approved of the principles put forth in the book, that God had ordained the existing procedures, and that they shouldn't be altered by a group of men. But the ministers said that those principles had been applied slightly wrong. A standing council which had power over the magistrates would be wrong, but because the one in Massachusetts operated independently, it was fine, and in fact it was helpful for the colony. The standing council shouldn't be abolished, but it should be perfected, and the way to do this was to provide strict limits to its power, as well as to include some freemen or deputies on the council. In addition, the ministers announced that the pamphlet's author shouldn't be censured because he was merely trying to promote the best interests of the colony. In addition, the ministers announced that the pamphlet's author should not be censured because he was merely trying to promote the best interests of the colony. With his safety assured, the man's identity was revealed, and it turned out to be the 32-year-old Richard Saltonstall, Jr. of Ipswich, son of the Richard Saltonstall who had helped found the colony. Saltonstall was serving his fifth term as a magistrate, and he had become one of the two magistrates to strongly and consistently support the deputy's position. So Saltonstall was safe, the standing council was preserved, but the ministers had recommended that deputies be added to it. This still left room for dispute, because the magistrates didn't want the deputies to continue to whittle away at their power, but it did put the issue on the back burner for the time being. And to the front burner came the question of the negative voice. And that brings us back to Roger Keene, who was at this point in time suing an old woman and her young tenant for slander. The lawsuit involved a conflict which had been going on for a couple of years at this point. So while I know that I've been going back and forth and forth and back in the last couple of episodes, It's time to go back to 1636. Years before Keene had been sued for economic oppression, he had found a pig, and he had advertised that he had found that pig multiple times over the course of a year. Everyone in town who had lost a pig came to see the one living at Keene's place, and one woman in particular claimed that the pig was hers. Her name was Elizabeth Sherman, also known as Goody Sherman, because Goody was a Puritan nickname for a lower-to-middle-class married woman, which is exactly what she was. A year later, no one had collected this pig, and at this point in time, 
king slaughtered a pig to eat, and immediately after he'd done so, Sherman went to see the pig in Keene's pen. She claimed that this one wasn't hers, and that therefore it meant that Keene had killed her pig and kept his own alive. She first complained to the church, but the church heard the evidence and exonerated Keene. After that, the issue died for three years. Sherman's husband moved back to England, and she took in a young merchant named George Story as a tenant. Meanwhile, Keene's reputation was destroyed by the nail fiasco. He was sued multiple times in the lower courts, often losing, not only because of his bad business reputation, but partially because of residual unpopularity from the antinomian controversy. In 1640, Story prompted Sherman to sue Keene in civil court, starting with the Boston Inferior Court. But again, the evidence wasn't on Sherman's side, and the jury found in favor of Keene, exonerating him and awarding him three pounds in court costs. For Keene, the victory was an opportunity to dissuade future lawsuits. He countersued Story and Sherman for defamation, and the court awarded him 20 pounds in damages. So Story prepared an appeal. He worked to build the town's hostility to Keene, not a difficult task, and he collected witnesses who could testify in court that the pig that Keene had killed matched Sherman's description of her own sow, white with a ragged ear and a black shilling-sized patch under one eye. Then Story petitioned the general court. Technically, the appeals process should have gone through the magistrates first at the Court of Assistance, but Story skipped that step, knowing that the magistrates were likely to vote in Keene's favor, and the general court accepted the petition anyway. Winthrop was concerned that the deputies would use this as a precedent to seize a greater share of judicial power, but the suit was inevitably going to end up at the general court anyway, and the magistrates just let the issue go. The testimony in front of the general court went on for seven days. Story had collected a large group of witnesses who said that the pig that Keene had killed was, in fact, white with a ragged ear and a patch under one eye, and Keene had a large group of witnesses who agreed with the description, but said the sow that Keene had killed had been one that he had bought from a man named Mr. Houghton. After a week of testimony, there was no way to prove that the sow was Sherman's. Even if all the witnesses were telling the truth, it would still prove Keene's innocence, because there was no contradiction in the testimony or evidence. One side was dealing with circumstantial evidence, though, while the other was giving a tangible and detailed version of the events, which incorporated circumstantial evidence, too. The evidence was, as had been established at lower courts, firmly on Keene's side. This put Winthrop and the magistrates firmly on Keene's side, with all but two, likely Saltonstall and Bellingham, voting in his favor. But the deputies disagreed. Sherman was a poor woman with no husband in New England, and Keene wasn't just a rich merchant. He was the rich merchant who had had his fine for economic oppression reduced without their consent two years before. They couldn't imagine making Sherman give Keene 20 pounds, even if he was innocent. So all but eight of them voted in her favor. The stage was perfectly set for a battle over the negative voice. Without the negative voice, the deputies would have given Sherman a landslide victory. 
with the negative voice, both groups had to agree in order to approve the appeal, and if one group, the magistrates, didn't approve the appeal, Keene automatically won because it was an appeal. So yet again, the magistrates were getting their way even though the deputies strongly and overwhelmingly disagreed with them. Neither group was prepared to back down, and the deputies decided that at this point they'd either overturn the negative voice or at least show the colony what a dangerous source of arbitrary power the magistrates were. Winthrop tried to adjourn the court on a positive note by passing a resolution stating that the members of the court were, despite disagreements, parting with affection and charity toward each other, but the resolution was rejected. The deputies were out for blood. When the court adjourned, the deputies went home to their towns and explained that the magistrates had used the negative voice to protect a corrupt, rich merchant against a poor old woman. It was a pretty easy line to push. People already disliked Keene, and Story had already been working to build hostility against him. And this was a spin on the story that made both the magistrates and the negative voice look absolutely indefensible. Both sides solicited the minister's support on the issue of the negative voice, with the deputies arguing that the magistrates might become corrupt, and Winthrop arguing that anyone could become corrupt, and that that wasn't a good reason to change the colony's political system into a mere democracy. If magistrate corruption became an issue, people could just elect new magistrates the next year. The ministers didn't really want to get involved in such a complex and heated issue, so they held off on addressing it. As the next court session approached, though, the ministers held a meeting and heard both the magistrates and the deputies' opinions on the Keene case. After hearing both sides, the ministers said that they didn't see any reason to continue with the case and urged the court to drop it. They also said that they would try to urge the deputies in their own individual towns to end the case, and at the meeting, Saltonstall agreed to drop the case, but Bellingham wouldn't budge. When the court session started, Story petitioned for yet another hearing. Going against their previous promises, all the deputies voted to receive it, including the ones who had agreed to drop the issue. They said that their constituents were angry because a rich merchant had been given 20 pounds from a poor woman. But the magistrates used their negative voice to prevent the case from being heard, again letting Keene off. By now, the momentum of pure emotion was on the deputies' side. So they attacked the negative voice directly. They published a treatise against the institution, and Winthrop published a defense of it, highlighting a well-established and widely held belief at the time that mixed governments were safer than those of a single type, like a pure democracy or a pure aristocracy. The deputies represented a purely democratic spirit, and The worst of that was illustrated by the fact that they would vote to convict a man without evidence, purely on emotion. If they removed the negative voice, it would destroy the mixed aristocratic-democratic nature of the government and create a mere democracy. But emotion is a powerful force, and when Bellingham and Saltonstall wrote their counter-treatise, it was clear that emotion could easily fuel their victory. They could win. They could win the Keene case, they could win the battle over the negative voice, and in so doing, they could win everything else. The magistrates' only hope was to bide their time and to let people's emotions die down and their thoughts refocus elsewhere. So they proposed a compromise. 
they would adjourn the court and seek the opinion of the ministers again. If the ministers agreed that the negative voice was a problem, the magistrates would agree to abolish it, and the deputies agreed to this arrangement. Winthrop then pushed for a meeting at which the ministers would mediate. They scheduled it for September, and in the meantime, Winthrop urged the colony's population to tell the ministers what they thought, or write their opinions on the case. And in the meantime, Winthrop completed and published a reply to Bellingham and Saltonstall's counter-treatise. This one reiterated former points, but it also expanded on them. Winthrop talked about traditional aristocratic forms of government and traditional merchant forms of government, and how New England differed from both. Aristocracy was the safest, pure form of government, and democracy was the least safe apart from an absolute monarchy. Mixed governments were safer, more steady, less corruptible, all while allowing the benefits of democratic input. The government which mixed aristocratic and popular elements was the type of which would excel in the long run, and that's what New England had forged in a completely unique way. The magistrates weren't an elite in the traditional sense, but they were people who were bestowed with the gifts of God, such as wisdom and learning. They weren't elite because of ancestry or money. They were elite because they were the best. This put the magistrates in the position of enabling an elevated, intellectual, and godly society to work without the types of elites who had damaged England. The magistrates' veto preserved all of this. Winthrop's impassioned plea convinced the ministers, and they barely even discussed the negative voice at the scheduled meeting. They were firmly on the side of Keene and of the negative voice, and the transition of the ministers from the deputy's side to the magistrates was complete. Cotton announced their support of the magistrates' position, and the ministers spent the rest of the meeting trying to convince the Newbury clergymen to stop embracing Presbyterianism. The deputies were alone, and they had lost. They had one last move, and that was to ask that the general court be split into a bicameral legislature. That would allow them to bring potential legislation to a vote, which was something that only the magistrates had previously been able to do. It would also allow them to debate questions on their own without the influence of the better educated, more articulate magistrates who so frequently dominated the discussion. The deputy role had originated when people were deputized to represent their own town's interests at the general court, but now, in a bicameral legislature, they were equal to the magistrates, so They didn't win everything, but they did completely redefine their role in the Massachusetts government, and in so doing, radically changed the government itself. The next year, aligning with the minister's recommendations, they tried to put deputies on the standing council and to push for the standing council to stop acting in an executive capacity. The magistrates refused, saying that they were the colony's executive branch and that the deputies would just have to deal with that, to which the deputies said that the standing council would not be obeyed. But though the spats between the magistrates and the deputies would continue, the Massachusetts government had taken its final form. All the biggest questions had been answered. There was a balance of power, delineation of authority, and a form of government which could endure and spread. As for Keene, the rest of his story wasn't a happy one. There were more lawsuits, most notably one in which a man 
alleged that his parents had sent him 200 pounds through Keene, but that Keene had stolen the money. Keene's meticulous record keeping yet again proved his innocence, but John Cotton encouraged him to hold off on suing for slander. He served in a variety of offices over the course of the next five years and invested in business endeavors like trade with the Caribbean. His son, who was married to Sarah Dudley, moved to London to help grow his business, but in London, Sarah had a series of affairs, gave his son an STD, divorced him, and left him unable to ever get married again, while her political connections enabled her to remarry. His son started to endure a share of the scrutiny that Keene himself had encountered and Devastated that the constant attacks had spread to his son, Keen started drinking, and his employees caught him drunk three times, so he was fined and fired from his public positions, and he died a year later, leaving a 153-page will explaining his side of every major conflict he'd been a part of. He also left a lot of money to the colony's public projects, with the stipulation that they leave his family alone. Thanks for listening. If you have any opinions, thoughts, or theories about anything we've discussed in the show, I'd love to hear from you either on Facebook or Twitter. And you can find those links at the website, AmericanHistoryPodcast.net, as well as links to first-hand accounts and things. See you next week.